Courses will be set, brackets will be filled. A mere six sleeps until Selection Sunday, as the madness is upon us. We gotta fill that bracket because the bracketology, we've been doing great work all year long. Our Jerry Palm with us in studio, joined by Adam Finkelstein as well, here to offer up their winners and losers from this Sunday, Jerry. When you walk away from it, I mean, Teams are sitting there on the bubble. Teams are in need of these resume builders, and certain teams got those. Who's your biggest winner here on Sunday? Yeah, my biggest winner is Ohio State. The Buckeyes have won five out of six, starting with a win over Purdue since they let go of Chris Holtman and put Jake Diebler in charge. And now they went from really just muddling through a just miserable season by mm -hmm. their standards. Now they're on the bubble. So now we're going to go into the Big Ten tournament. We don't know exactly where they're going to be, but most likely an 8-9 game, which means another shot at Purdue in game two if they get there. And if you win that game, well, maybe now you're actually in the NCAA tournament, and what a turnaround that would be. We're getting sized up for some conference tourney basketball and then the big dance. Adam, as you take a look at Sunday, who did themselves the biggest favor, your biggest winner? Well, because we both can't pick Ohio State, I'm going to go with Drake because they, they played their way into the tournament. Mm -hmm. I mean, Indiana State came in as the favorite. Drake had an 18-point lead, uh, and then they saw it go away. You would think that was had all the makings of a collapse, but instead, Tucker DeVries responds in a huge way. 27 points, 7 rebounds, 5 assists, and 4 of 5 from behind the three-point line. This is a guy who was on the NBA radar last season, but he plays for his dad. He wanted to come back and get back to the NCAA tournament, and now he's doing it. And I'll tell you what, this guy is an NBA player. Think Kyle Korver when you watch Tucker DeVries. It was a blast to watch him ball out in this one, and that one, a taste of the finite nature of March that is upon us now. And that finite nature might be a more real end to the story and a more immediate one for some teams that they had hoped, Jerry. Your biggest loser on Sunday was who? Yeah, it's Indiana State, the other team in that game. The Sycamores had a tremendous season, but unfortunately they don't have an at-large quality resume. And they're probably, they could be the highest rated team in the net left out of the bracket. But, you know, they only played uh, two good teams outside of league, Alabama and Michigan State. Not really competitive in either of those games, both on the road, of course. But the worst thing to happen to Indiana State was getting ranked in the middle of the season. And they lost two games that week that did enough damage to their resume to, to do away really with their at-large hopes. We'll take a deeper look at that resume in a moment, but first, Adam, your biggest loser here on Sunday is who? Well, I've got to concur on that one. I mean, Indiana State, uh, 24th in the net. I know they are still hoping uh, they have a shot. They're going to have to sit and wait on it for a week. I'll tell you who, I'll tell you what, though. The other teams on the bubble, they are hoping Jerry is right, and fortunately, he very often is, because if they do make the field, that's one more team from the bubble that would not make it. They end up becoming a, a bid stealer, if you will. And that's gonna be a very interesting theme, not just with Indiana State, but with others, to see how these conference tournaments go in the perceived one bid leagues. It's gonna be a fascinating dynamic to play out this week. Yeah, in that MVC on one side, it was a ticket punched on the other. Maybe hope knocked out as we take a look at the resume of the Sycamores, that tree could be chopped, projected as out right now by our bracketologist Jerry Palm sitting at 27 and six, their net. You see it, it might say tourney, but the field around them might say otherwise. All right, back in the mix with our guys as we explore the top of this bracket as well. Jerry, we've been talking about it the whole season. Your beloved Purdue Boilermakers, I know you approach it from an unbiased standpoint, but when we look at them as not just a one seed, but the potential one seed overall, what needs to be accomplished at the Big Ten tournament for them to realize that? Well, they have to probably win the Big Ten tournament. It depends on what the other teams do. It, the, the competition for the overall number one is Purdue, UConn, Houston, and they're close together. So if one of these teams doesn't win their conference tournament and the other two do, the one that doesn't is probably third overall. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, the overall number one seed is probably going to be a conference champion. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Purdue's number one seed in the Midwest. UConn's number one seed in the East. Houston's the number one seed in the South, regardless of which, which order the committee gives us those three teams. On Oscar night, uh, we are handing out awards a week early, but it is how they have distanced themselves throughout this entire season that has earned them that sort of runway. A Adam, you can give me your point of view here on Purdue, but I want to ask it this way. Do you feel differently about this version of Purdue than the one we saw a year ago? And I mean, the one 
that we saw a year ago. They're going to be a one again. Should we feel differently heading into the tournament? Yeah, I think we should. I mean, the first thing we have to acknowledge is, there, is that there's going to be pressure based on what happened last season. Mm -hmm. These these are players that love their coach, and they know their coach is being criticized for his postseason record, and they're going to want to win for their coach. This is very similar to the dynamic when Virginia won a national championship after being bounced uh, in the first round that was the next year later, and you could see in that opening round how tight the players were because they wanted to play for Tony Tony Bennett. I think Purdue wants to play for Matt Painter here. The reason, though, that it's different from last year, yes, they still have Zach Eady in the middle, and yes, they play through him. Last year, they were one of the slowest teams in the country, and they were a bad three-point shooting team. This year, they're about middle of the pack in tempo, and they're the second best three-point shooting team in the entire country. Last year, they had two freshmen starting in the backcourt. This year, they've got two sophomores and a senior. So they're playing faster, they're playing with more shooting, they're playing with a lot more experience. If they can get over the nerves in round one, I think they've got a chance, obviously, to get all the way to the Final Four. Yeah, finding a way to make sure that residue of what was doesn't affect them here in the present. Let's stay in the B1G and go elsewhere. I'm going to go to Michigan State with you, Adam, right now, because it's a close one, it's on the chin, and the record doesn't scream a, a conference tourney outside of a conference tourney championship. It doesn't scream tourney to us. When you're looking at Michigan State right now, it, it's not a March Madness without them, but it appears that it could be a March Madness without them. Where do you see Sparty right now? Well, it hasn't been a good couple of weeks. I mean, they've lost four out of five, and three of those losses are to teams that they were expected to beat when you look at Iowa, Ohio State, and then Indiana. So they're 18 and 13 overall, 10 and 10 in the Big Ten. Now, coming in today, they were still top 25 in the net and 19th in Ken Palm. So their metrics are better than their overall record, especially when you start to dig in. I know this isn't a factor that the committee takes into consideration, but they've got a top 10 defense in the country. So, I, again, I defer to Jerry on this, but I'm just shocked that it's come to this because uh, two weeks ago this was not a conversation we were expecting to have when you looked at what their record was and who they were finishing the season with. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny you mentioned the defense and that the committee doesn't really consider that. They actually are more likely to consider the fact that this is a really good defensive team than their net ranking because your net ranking alone, if that's all you have, you have nothing. So, you know, Michigan State, they, they took that home losses to Iowa and Ohio State back to back and it just seems to have thrown them off. Uh, this is a, they almost won at Purdue. They, they gave Purdue a really good fight right after that but they just haven't found a way to get the W's that they need to sustain this NCAA tournament resume. I haven't had them on the bubble. I may have them on the back on the bubble tomorrow. The, NC, or the Big Ten tournament draw is going to be really important for them because they need to get a game that they can win and get some momentum because this is a team that has not played to the level of its talent mm -hmm. all season long. You are what you are. The tape is the tape, and name brand only gets you so far this time of year. We have a long way to go, but in many ways, we're right there at the precipice too, Jerry. Selection Sunday coming at us quickly here. Auto bids abound in the week to come. I, I want to ask you what you have your eye on this week, but that's asking like how you're going to mop up the ocean. There's a lot of work to be done. So what gets you excited about the week to come? The thought of maybe getting six sleeps, but probably five instead of four. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to be looking at the, the bubble because that's, you know, the it's really the most important part. And, and the committee likes to say, you can play your way out of a bad seed, but you can't play your way out of being selected. So really, you know, the important work is goes into making sure they have the right teams. And the, the bubble, of course, this time of year, you've got, oh, at least a dozen teams still that can go either way in this bracket. And you might have teams go on and off the bubble in these conference tournaments. But in particular, the Big East, because you've got four teams there that could still play their way in or out. Two of them play each other in the 4-5 game, Seton Hall and St. John's, which is considered, by the way, a home game for St. John's. It's kind of silly, but that's the way it is. Um, and then the winner of that game gets a shot at UConn. Meanwhile, Villanova and Providence, who need to stack wins, get you know first round games against DePaul and Georgetown, and then a chance to play someone like Creighton or Marquette. And while those are great teams, you're not playing UConn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got something, you feel like you've got something of a chance there uh, to resume build. So that Big East, the way that sorts out this conference tournament is going to really be interesting to see which of those four teams, if any, end up making the NCAA tournament.
And I'll tell you what, if you're looking for storylines connected to that Big East tournament, how about the fact that both Rick Pitino at St. John's and Richard Pitino at New Mexico are on the bubble? Reminds me very much of a few years back when Dan Hurley was at Rhode Island and Bobby Hurley was at Arizona State. Rhode Island loses in the conference tournament. If you remember, there was this moment when the uh, Rhode Island reveal party when Dan Hurley saw that Arizona State made the tournament and he wasn't responsible for knocking his brother out, the relief on his face. It could be that kind of dynamic here with St. John's and New Mexico at play. I completely agree that the dominoes are going to be uh, most intense at the Big East tournament. I think the Big Ten tournament is also going to be right with storylines. But the narrative of the Patino family, let's face it, this is college basketball. Rick Patino is the godfather of college basketball, and everybody wants to see him in the tournament. But whether or not he gets there, who, who he may knock out to get there, those are going to be some of the most interesting and compelling storylines of this week. Are you laughing because you're thinking the same thing as me right now? Yeah. The, the kiss on the cheek? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was you, Rich. <laughs> uh, we got so much fun to be had here in the week to come, and storylines just like that that we're going to be fixated on. Adam, Jerry, we appreciate you guys. As always, Selection Sunday soon come. We'll have you covered right here on CBS Sports HQ. As the brackets released, we react, and we'll get right to the picks as well. Join us on Selection Sunday.